welcome to you all. As the holidays draw to a close in the UK, let's not forget the people of Palestine and their struggle for justice. I'm Amina Taylor and I'll be your host on this edition of Remember Palestine. Today's show looks at the plight of Palestinians coping with scarce resources in the Gaza Strip. They've been under the Israeli siege since 2007. Now, in spite of the many efforts of the international community during the past 12 months, the blockade has not been lifted. As we speak with two organizations working in the region, we also recall Operation Cast Lead, which claimed the lives of over 1,400 Gazans. We'll be discussing the ongoing effects of the stifling siege with a program officer for medical aid for Palestinians, as well as a representative of the Palestinian Center for Human Rights. That and so much more, but first, a report on the ongoing situation in Gaza from our correspondent there, Youssef El Halou. The Gaza Strip is known to be the world's largest open air prison. The seaside territory is 25 miles long, 8 miles wide, which is home to 1.6 million people, where children up to the age of 14 make up around 44% of the Strip's population. The densely populated enclave has been under Israeli siege for almost five years. This has led to the collapse of the economy and resulted in a decline in social services and an increasing lack of opportunities. By the close of 2011, the global population will have reached 7 billion people, with experts saying that Gaza is facing serious problems as being the most highly populated area in the world. The Palestinian Bureau of Statistics provided an overview of the situation of the Palestinian population in 2011. About 70% of Gaza's population depend on aid assistance. About 5,000 people live on one square kilometre. Gaza is in need for 18,000 housing units and 270 schools and 70 hospitals and clinics. Agriculture areas are being used to absorb the increasing population. In light of the high level of unemployment and poverty caused by the blockade, about two-thirds of the population rely on aid assistance provided by international NGOs. Israel's frequent ground incursions and air raids, as well as the ongoing blockade, has had serious economic and humanitarian implications. Of course, the economy in Gaza, one of the, the biggest consequences of this is the economy, how the economy can create jobs for these people, for example, or provide food, and how we can, as a Palestinian, manage the resources that we have. For example, if we want to build a school, we need land. If we want to build clinics, we want land. And Gaza suffers security of land. The worrying economic situation and estimated population growth seems to be a ticking demographic time bomb with endemic poverty and lack of opportunities haunting the population as a result of the Israeli blockade. It is both a challenge and opportunity with implications on sustainability, urbanization, access to health and education services, as well as youth and women empowerment. Currently, the population in Gaza is 1.6 million people, and the number will increase by the year 2025 to 2.6 million people, which will impose a greater challenge that needs to be addressed through providing needed services. Yusuf al Hello, reporting from River Palestine, Gaza. So much to discuss there, and to help me with that is Sarah Hamila. She's the program officer with Medical Aid for Palestinians. You might know them a little bit better off as MAP. They're an organization working in the occupied territories for over two decades now, delivering much needed medical help to the besieged people. Sarah, it's good to have you on the final program for 2011. Youssef touched on a lot of things there, but perhaps the most crucial is the growing population and what that means for resources when they're on the siege. Absolutely. It's been a growing issue amongst the international community and NGOs in particular. Ever since 2007, we've seen um, a shortage of supplies and resources because of the growing population. But at the backdrop of all of this, and something that we must not forget, is the fact that the only reason why the resources are, are scarce is because of the occupation. Um, and, and as a result of that, we need far more international pressure applied, and we need far more NGOs working in Gaza, making sure that the, the, the resources 
resources are there for the people. Now, over the past few years, we've actually seen a decline in NGOs working in Gaza because of the political why, situation. Why is that? It's very difficult to manoeuvre? It is very difficult to manoeuvre. The political situation makes it difficult to actually have aid that's having an effect. And at that point, NGOs need to make the choice between the do-no-harm do policy, it's simple as that, um, and, and they have to retract their projects. Now, MAP in particular has been one of the few NGOs that has worked consistently over the past 27 to 30 years across Palestine. And one of the things that we found in particular is that the medical aid is becoming increasingly scarce. We're seeing zero stock, zero stock refers to those medical supplies that are absolutely essential. Um, they're, they're now reaching at zero level. Um, and so doctors are unable to treat their patients and it's becoming an increasing concern and it's something that the international community needs to work with NGOs to overcome. Because that must be completely dispiriting for a medical professional to know what's wrong with the patient, mm -hmm. know how they can cure them, mm -hmm. but unable to get hold of that essential medication? Absolutely. I think that's the first issue there is the fact that when a doctor treats a patient, knowing what the problem is, it may be cancer, it may, it may be um, a kidney failure, the fact, uh, the fact is there's no medicine out there or there's very little medicine out there to actually you know, overcome the problems that the Palestinians face in terms of health. The second issue I think which is worth raising as well is that there's a lack of doctors, there's a lack of human resources you could say. So with the population increasing, each doctor is having less and less patient time. Um, and when you have, you know, three to four minutes per patient, you cannot identify what the disease is or what the problem is with the patient. You look at the symptoms and you make a, you know, within your very restricted time limit, you make a judgment. And from that, you're seeing, you know, far more problems arising. You know, doctors aren't able to pick up on um, problems of anemia that uh, newborn mo mothers may have. And in turn, that has a huge impact because the child that's born may be born with a lot of complications. It may be born disabled. The child may be born, um, you know, with some sort of de deformities. Um, and so it's having huge implications in the long term, but of course also in the short term. And it's, it's the reason to why we need need more international uh, presence in Gaza. And to make it work, Sarah, stay with us because we have more on this general issue, the effect of the siege for Gazans, especially at this time of year, of course the third anniversary of Operation Cast Lead. Now joining us from Gaza City is Linda Deleu. She's from the Palestinian Center for Human Rights and three years, as I mentioned there, after Operation Cast Lead, the organization is still calling for change with so many people still suffering, we're finding out what some of those issues are and potential solutions. Lydia, thank you so much for joining us this day. Right now, you're in Gaza City. What are the burning concerns? Uh, well, unfortunately, as usual, there are too many. Um, but as always, uh, it's, it's again the, the illegal closure imposed on the Gaza Strip that maintains to uh, have an, a, a severe impact on the healthcare system and the health of people. Uh, again, we would like to stress as PCHR that this closure has resulted not only in the healthcare system to be crippled, um, but also the transfer of patients outside as a result of the crippled system uh, is still a grave violation of, of human rights, right to health. For example, 20%, uh, according to WHO uh, statistics of 2010, WHO of which Israel is actually a member, in 2010, 20% of the travel permits submitted to Israel uh, for patients needing to travel outside to medical treatment there uh, were delayed. And 50% of the delays was for men aged between 18 and 40. So there's a, a clear sign that the men are actually held back in their medical treatment more than anyone else. And unfortunately, PCHR since June 2007 has recorded 10 deaths of patients who were waiting to get their uh, transfer, their permit approved by the Israeli authorities and they have died uh, while waiting for the medical treatment and amongst them were 17 children and 30 women. So that's the access to healthcare that is violated and the other problem is that the healthcare system in the Gaza Strip is highly affected as well. Um, you can see that the medical shortages, uh, medicines and medical supplies uh, like has been raised by many NGOs including MAP and PCHR in the recent months 
is uh, one third of the medical, uh, the essential medicines and approximately one fifth of the essential medical supplies are at zero stock level in the Gaza Strip. Most recently, uh, dialysis filters for kidney patients that were completely depleted. So that meant that all, uh, all dialysis sessions of patients across the Gaza Strip were stopped. And after severe pressure from international organizations and local organizations like PCHR, there has been a limited supply, but still the problem is not resolved. And that's not only due to the closure and the, uh, the lack of uh, Israeli authorities to, to live up to the standards, but also the political difficulties and, and disagreement between the ruling parties in the West Bank and the Gaza Strip uh, have resulted in a lack of coordination and supplies to the Gaza Strip. So it's all about a lottery. It depends on the time the individual gets sick. This could determine yeah. whether you live or die. Yeah, if you apply at the wrong time or if you... Um, it's like when entering uh, or exiting the Gaza Strip, you don't know what you will find at the border. The patients who... Um, even if you do get the travel permit, let's say uh, you're sick, you have a chronic disease or you suffer from cancer and your treatment, like the treatment for cancer, it's not available in the Gaza Strip. So there is no option but you traveling out of the Gaza Strip. And if you do, there is a chance that you arrive at the border and you will be subjected to interrogation or even in the process of applying for your, your travel permit, uh, there is a chance that you have to agree to undergo interrogation with the Israeli uh, uh, intelligence services before even being considered to travel outside. So patients are even forced to choose between uh, cooperating or collaborating, if you, if you would like to call it that, with occupation authorities before even being considered to see a doctor outside the besieged, the closed Gaza Strip. And very quickly, Lydia, what are you calling on the international community for? What can we do? Uh, well, actually, it's, it's, a, it's an, a call that has been repeated many times by PCHR, by other human rights organizations and international activists, is that all those resolutions that have been passed over the recent years and all the treaties that have been signed with very clear cuts and, and very nice words, uh, to finally be up, upheld and implemented. Like on the 10th of December, we celebrated again, tried to celebrate the anniversary of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And all we can ask for is to actually uh, do honor to the word universal and to, uh, to take action to make sure that Israel, uh, first of all, ends the illegal closure of the Gaza Strip, ends the occupation of the, of the territories, and make sure, that all, that make sure that all parties involved do whatever they can to ensure basic human rights, including the right to health of the Palestinian people. Well said. Thank you so much. Lydia Delu there from the Palestinian Human Rights Organization. And Map Sara Hamila was in the studio and shook her head from time to time with some of those sentiments expressed there from Gaza City because we haven't even managed to talk about education yeah. yet. The fact that people are dying because they can't get the appropriate medications and they can't get the appropriate permits for essential operations, put that with the backdrop of Operation Cast Lead and the ongoing siege, it's not a very positive picture we're painting, but it's the truth. No, unfortunately it's not a positive picture, but in order for NGOs and the international community to do something about this, we need to understand what the picture is. and. Unfortunately, in the past, NGOs and uh, donor states have given Gaza some medical supplies which were ineffective or out of date. Or well, no point giving them the wrong needed. things. They it? were essentially the wrong, they were the wrong things. And what we have to do now is to understand what Gaza actually needs and what they need at the moment as it stands is the medical supplies. They also need to train the doctors up so, we, so that we're capacity building, so that the Palestinian population can stand on their own two feet rather than relying so much on international aid. And that's what MAP does. We train, we're involved in training doctors and training nurses and ensuring that they're specialised within certain remits such as primary trauma care or such as burns training, um, which is an ongoing problem in Gaza because of the increasing level of population. So training and making sure that the Palestinian population have access to, to you know standing on their own two feet is absolutely crucial second NGOs need to record information 
So when a patient dies because of the lack of um, access, that information needs to be recorded in order for people to advocate on behalf of you know, their countries and their, 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 on behalf of um, their representatives. Because it's different to say somebody died of renal failure, but Absolutely. yes, because they couldn't get to an appropriate hospital to Absolutely. have this treatment. Absolutely. The done. fact that you cannot get to an appropriate hospital to not have adequate treatment and as a result suffer from that, it's, it's a denial of their, of their human right and it's a basic human right to have to have um, you know a health system that's there and provides for you to live a healthy life it's a basic human right that we need every day we take that for granted in the UK for example you know if we're suffering from a migraine we would go to our local pharmacy store and we'd pick up you know paracetamol Palestinians are living in Gaza a simple thing like that is something that they're unable to do it's because there's no medical supplies out there and so we need to highlight that issue the other thing I wanted to mention... And very quickly, I think we've got 10 seconds. The other thing I wanted to mention is that states need to be working with NGOs like MAP. We have the expertise and the knowledge of working in the local area and states need to know exactly what is needed. They cannot work on, uh, in isolation and neither can NGOs. They need to work together and aid needs to come together to actually be political and say, this is wrong, what's going on? And the solution and is to remove it. the blockade. Sorry, Hamila. Thank you so much. And on that rather sobering note, we go to something else that's a bit of a travesty, actually, because the holidays are supposed to be a time of compassion and charity. But for one particular group of people, the Christmas spirit, well, it was distinctly absent. Only 500 out of 3,000 Christian Palestinians who live in Gaza were allowed to travel to the holy sites in the West Bank. The permits given by the Israeli authorities during the 2011 Christmas holidays had an age limitation that affected many families from the Strip. The website of the Israeli military makes these restrictions clear. 500 visitor permits for Christian Palestinians from the Gaza Strip to Israel and the Judea and Samaria region in order to visit their families and participate in religious ceremonies will be provided to minors under the age of 16 and adults over the age of 45. Going to Bethlehem is a holy Christian pilgrimage and is the right of each Christian in Gaza. Christian or non-Christian, we believe that everybody has the right to reach Bethlehem to pray there and praise God. The Christians in this country are an inseparable part of this nation. They share the same suffering and have the same hope. 2011 was the year when the mayor of Bethlehem declared Christmas a celebration of hope for Palestinian independence. The theme was chosen to commemorate Palestine's admission as a full member at UNESCO in October. However, Christian Palestinians from Gaza also faced restrictions from travelling abroad, and only 400 were allowed to fly via the Ben Gurion airport despite restrictions supposedly being eased by Israeli authorities. Now Joshua Blakeney is a freelance journalist and an activist, MA's doctoral candidate, and he's based in Canada and he joins us now via Skype. It's so good to have you on the program with us, Joshua. Welcome, a warm, warm welcome to you. It's great to be with you, thanks for having me. It's the third anniversary of Operation Cast Lead, and sometimes it feels as if we're repeating ourselves, saying, when will the international community come down more on Israel and tell them enough is enough? How are things in Canada, and what's the Canadian government doing? Well, I was quite pleased to see Peter Oburn's expose of the Israel lobby in the UK, where we were able to... Uh, observed that there was a has been a network that's uh, infested itself in the British Parliament to lobby for impunity for the uh, war criminals who have visited these heinous crimes and continue to visit these crimes upon the beleaguered Palestinians in Gaza and the West Bank. In Canada, we've had no such expose. And I have to tell you that, you know, I'm doing my MA thesis here on the events of 9-11. I've been studying 9-11 for four years intensively. And I could tell you there's many indications that Israel was complicit in the events of 9-11. And I do believe that those of us living in North America and in Britain, we have an, op we have an opportunity with 9-11 to uh, raise the consciousness of the American people in particular to pressure their government to uh, shift their, uh, their uh, policies towards the Israeli government. I think many would agree that the only way 
we're going to bring these crimes to an end is if the U.S. government imposes an embargo on Israel, shifts its uh, policy towards Israel, ends the special relationship. And, you know, like on 9-11, there was five Israelis arrested. I could go on. All the airports were run by Israeli companies. But you see, Joshua, with, with arguments like these, it is very difficult when, if you just look at what's going on with the presidential Republican candidates at the moment, they're tripping over themselves to be seen as the one with the most special relationship. I, I don't see this ending anytime soon, unfortunately. Well, that's because the American people don't empathize with Arabs and Muslims because Arabs and Muslims have been dehumanized in the Western media. And I think the only way to get Americans in particular to empathize with the Palestinian struggle is to tell them that actually 3,000 of their people were slaughtered on 9-11 with the complicity of the Israeli government. And I know this is a controversial point, but I'm telling you there's an abundance of evidence on this subject matter. Uh, and false flag terrorism is a, 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 a consistent policy of the Israeli government going back to the genesis of the Zionist movement. And so that's what I'm doing in my graduate studies. But I also think it's important to remind your, your viewers that all the, these uh, absurd uh, atrocities, all these absurd atrocities that are being uh, committed in Gaza are all predicated on the fact that the Palestinian people elected the wrong government in January 2006. I mean, this is outrageous. I mean, and it, the fact it that certainly we get is, Joshua. It certainly is. Thank you so much for joining us. Our time always too short when we have interesting conversations there. And sadly, we're entering a whole new year and we're hoping against hope that the Palestinians will not be left to the will of inactive political leaders for another year. So to show just how much ordinary citizens are trying to accomplish, here is this edition of Global Resistance. <laughs> The American filmmaker Nicole Bellevian continues her quest to get the funds to produce the first dramatic feature film made in Hebron called Sleeping Stones. Sleeping Stones tells the story of two boys, one Palestinian and one Jewish, who bond through their passion for football. Later on, the Israeli occupation challenges their friendship. As major studios are not interested in producing the story, Bolivian is asking the audience to help with funding the movie through Facebook and her website, www.sleepingstones.com. To start 2010 in the spirit of Occupy Wall Street and not Palestine, Palestinian author Omar Barghouti will be giving a speech in California on the 7th of January. The event will also serve for the signing of his 2011 book, Boycott, Divestment, Sanctions, The Global Struggle for Palestinian Rights. A group of Palestinians and international artists took to the stage at Bethlehem between the 23rd and 25th of December to send a message of peace and promoting Palestinian culture. The Shepherd's Night Festival aimed to provide tourism in Palestine and its culture. This year, the event also intended to remind the international community Palestinians' right to self-determination. And that's it, I'm afraid, all the time we have today. This has been Remember Palestine, and I've been your host for this show. Amina Taylor, on behalf of myself and all the crew, the guests from today's programs, and also throughout the past 12 months, stay faithful, maintain solidarity, and spread the word. Until next time. Thank you.